Welcome, everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining the uh, webinar today. Today, we're going to be uh, having a session to kind of demystify the upgrade process to OIE. So uh, we're going to talk about some of the common um, common issues you may see, your common questions that we run across in talking to customers about, uh, about OIE or the upgrade process. Um, and hopefully try to help uh, clarify some of the questions you may have, or if uh, if you still have some questions, provide you with the resources that you need to get answers to your questions uh, going forward. Um, I'm joined today, as always, by my colleague, Dimitri, uh, who is from the um, product marketing team. My name is Brent Arrington. I'm from the product acceleration team here at Okta, focusing on OIE. Uh, and we're also joined today by a few of my colleagues from the product acceleration team who are going to be monitoring the Q and A section um, of the the Zoom chat. So, uh, a couple of logistic items uh, as we're going through the presentation today. If you do have questions, please post those in the Q and A. Uh, our my colleagues will be answering those feverishly as we go in the Q and A in the in the session. If we have time at the end of the session, we'll try to address some questions live as well. Uh, and if there are any questions that we are unable to get to during the session today, we will uh, track those and post those in the community site with responses. And we'll have links to that community site coming up at the end of this presentation as well. All right, so before we dive in, uh, I do have to present the Ubiquitous Safe Harbor disclaimer. This presentation uh, will contain some forward-looking statements. Um, and as far as the reason we're all here today is we're, we're talking about Okta Identity Engine, and we're going to talk about some of the, you know, some of the questions or our common questions that we see. But before we get into that, let's let's talk about what OIE is and, and why you would want to upgrade to OIE in the first place. Uh, so Okta Identity Engine is a, a full uh, platform upgrade that delivers enhanced security as well as improved user experience options. Among other, among other things, OIE can help to accelerate the implementation of things like passwordless flows, zero trust use cases, uh, and provide greater flexibility and scalability of, of creating secure identity flows. So these use cases are all these use cases are supported by a number of OIE features, some of which we'll touch on here today, some of which we've already touched on in more detail in some of the previous webinars. And we'll we'll provide you with links to where you can find those if you weren't able to join those uh, briefly. So before we, uh, our guest to kick things off for us today, I'm going to turn it over to Dimitri to give us a, a review of some of the differences between OIE and Classic Engine. Uh, so Dimitri, it's all you. Thank you, Brent. So welcome everyone to this uh, to this webinar too. It's my pleasure to uh, to go over some of the the content with you today. Um, yeah, we can move on to the next slide, uh, Brent. Thank you. So I want to give you a few uh, understanding of some of the fundamental of OIE or the things that you will find different uh, coming from Classic. Um, we've touched on this in previous webinars and there are also a couple of blog posts that goes into more details, but I want at least to give you a, a brief overview and leave you with a couple of uh, reference slides you can use. So there are four areas we're going to cover, actually uh, three now and the last one later on. So we're going to talk about authenticators. Uh, you will see that uh, we've changed a little bit the vocabulary with OIE to, to align with industry standard and, and NIST recommendations. So we talk about authenticators, authentication method, and factor types, and I'm going to cover that. We're also bringing a new uh, policy framework, uh, which I will uh, explain the, the concept and show you a little bit of the of the um, of the administrator interface. Uh, sorry, and finally, uh, OIE we encourage you to take an approach which is based on assurance level a assurance level model, and I will I will give you an example of that so you can understand. We also cover device context, uh, but we'll cover that into the um, into the the feature section after the live demo. Uh, because it is a, it is a big announcement in uh, in OIE. There's uh, many more things you can learn from the devices. So moving on to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about authenticators. So authenticators are things that uh, the end user will use to authenticate, uh, and authenticators have a authentication method of certain factor types. So 
Very simple examples here. A password, obviously, is an authenticator, an authentication method, and it is of knowledge factor type. You're probably very aware of that. It's the most, I would say, the simple and common authenticator that we love or hate. Um, if you take the phone, it's a, a little more interesting because a phone has actually two authentication methods. You can use either an SMS or you can use a voice call. And it is a possession factor type. Now, where authenticators really start to uh, unleash a lot of power and become very interesting is when you start looking at uh, applications. Uh, for, and for example, uh, you probably know Google Authenticator, but also OctaVerify, which is our leading authenticator. And uh, those authenticators are much more sophisticated because they combine uh, multiple factor types. Uh, because it's an app, it's a possession factor type. Uh, but it can also leverage uh, the biometrics uh, on your device, so it can add an inherence factor. And uh, if you have hardware protection, and if you actually uh, use um, uh, public keys and private keys uh, in your infrastructure, you can even get a knowledge factor type. So those authenticators as an application can be very sophisticated. We'll talk a little more about FastPass uh, later on. So that's the new definition, vocabulary, authenticators, authentication method, and factor type. Now let's look at the, the, the new policy framework on the next slide. So the, the way it, it functions on OIE is a little bit different. When, when an end user comes in, everything goes through the global session policy. Now, once you are in the global session policy, there are three options you can take here. You can decide that actually the, 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 the authentication will be, elevate, will be evaluated at the application level. So nothing you know, happen at the global policy. Um, or you can enforce a password if you still decide to do so. That's the second option. The third one is uh, factor sequencing. Not, not everybody in Classic use factor sequencing. So if you don't use it, you can forget it immediately because you will not see it in OIE when you upgrade. Now, if you have been using factor sequencing, you will still have the option to use factor sequencing. Now, once you've passed the global policy, click please, you get into the application context and click. And once you are in the application context, this is where you're going to hit the authentication policy. Now, authentication policy, we are going to look into more details on the next slide, but you can create an assurance level. And what is different with OIE is that rather than specifying uh, specific factors, factor, uh, factors or a specific sequence of factor, here you have a much more abstract approach. You will see that you can say, I want a possession factor, or I want any one factor, or any two factors. And the identity engine will figure out which authentication method to propose to the end user based on the authenticators you've set up into your organization. What is also important to note here is that uh, you can actually bucket your applications into, uh, into different blocks because uh, an authentication policy can be applied to multiple applications. So you don't have to create one uh, uh, authentication policy for every app, but you can sort your application in different, uh, different buckets. Now, if you click one more time, one last time, obviously uh, the policy context area at the level of the global session policy, you will find what you used to know uh, in terms of network zone, uh, IDP provider, behavior risk score. And at the level of the application policy, we will see that a little more in the context for device context, but you also can uh, uh, use a, a number of uh, context elements and even add some expression where we will see that this is a uh, pretty powerful when in uh, when it comes to uh, to device context so that's the the concept if you want of the new or, or the or the or the, um, the 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 org chart of the new authentication policy now if we move on into the next slide how does that materialize is you can see the the the, the administrator uh, interface here for the global policy so you can see uh, if you click uh, once more time you can see in the establish the user session with that the three options we talked about Either you say, well, go look at the level of the authentication policy or enforce a password or a first sequence. And again, if you never hear the factor sequencing, you will not see this choice. Now, when you go at the level of the authentication policy, uh, if you click one more time uh, and one more time, um, there we go, you can see that, again, you don't describe exactly which authentication method you want, but you d define the outcome that you want. You can say, I want any two factor, I want a password, I want a possession factor. So you will see all the different combinations that make sense here. And again, OIE will figure out which uh, authentication method uh, will be prompted for the end user. So that's the new framework. Now, what is the best way to use this framework? If we move on to the next slide, 
uh, the best way is to uh, uh, get uh, what we call an assurance levels approach. And, and you have an example here. So this is not a, a reference uh, implementation. If you want, you will have to uh, tailor that to your specific uh, security requirements and needs. But the overall idea here is we're going to create three buckets, a low assurance, a medium assurance, and a high assurance. Low assurance will be for applications that do not really have any uh, I would say the critical or important or even important things. So application like a dashboard or a launch selection menu. Medium assurance in the middle will be when we start getting into collaboration or basic, basic business apps. And high assurance is really where you get into financial apps, intellectual property, uh, uh, whatever critical, business critical uh, applications are. Now, once you've defined those three levels, you can start creating a combination of uh, assurance level at the device level and at the authentication method level. So in our example, we said, well, for low assurance can be any device and just any one factor. So which means that OIE will propose, assuming you obviously have those authenticators, a password or an OTP, uh, or an OTP, uh, um, or an OTP, uh, one-time password, either a fixed password or a one-time password. For medium assurance, we say, well, we start getting into our business. So for this one, we probably want a registered device, and we will discuss how this happened uh, later in the in the presentation. And you want a possession and a knowledge factor types. So in this case, you might be prompted for a password and an OTP this time. For the highest insurance, we probably want the device not only to be registered, but to be managed. We want to have an MDM in place and even maybe an EDR. And for this one, we really want the highest uh, assurance level. So we want an insurance factor. So we want biometrics and we want a possession or a knowledge type. And in this case, what would uh, uh, satisfy uh, this, um, this requirement is either WebAuthn with biometric or our uh, FastPass uh, with biometric as well. So. This is really to encourage you to think along this assurance level and, and, and actually create a model that best suits your organization. And you see that it's a much more abstract way to do it and then why you basically figure out the rest. So these are some of the concepts. Before we move on to the live demo, I want to give you a few reference charts. Uh, so for before and after for administrators, uh, if we look on the next slide, I've done here a mapping on what you had in classic and what you have in OIE. So first click. Uh, what you use to find in authentication goes in the global session policy, with the exception of the password policy is actually in the authenticators. So second click, what you had in multi-factor goes into authenticators. So this is where you define all your authenticators and the enrollment policy as well. And third click, uh, what you had in uh, application, so the app sign-on become the authentication policy here. So this is where you will create your authentication policies. And finally, and we'll talk about uh, this also later in the, in the presentation, final click, uh, device trust which was uh, pretty much limited to integration with MDN tools in, uh, in Classic, now has m many more features like device assurance and device integration, and we'll cover that uh, later in the seminar. So this is the, uh, the impact on the administrator. And so these are a few reference charts you can use uh, every day when you, when you first upgrade to OIE. Finally, if we look at the, um, the, the last section, oh, sorry, uh, uh, the, now this, um, yeah, go, go back, uh, uh, Brent. I was a little ahead of sequence. So finally, here you see the, the, the same relationship between the, 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 the difference between the, the, the classic sign-on, the, the, the global session policy, and applying the application level policy. So if you have a factor sequence, you will find that again. So uh, moving on to the next slide, finally, the end user um, uh, impact. So here on the, on the left, and, and Brent will show you more uh, the details when we go into the, uh, into the live demo, but I wanted to give you the visual here. The, the first widget where you put your username, uh, very, very similar. Now on classic, uh, you actually have the little arrow to select which authentication method you have. On OIE, when you first put your username and go to next, you will be uh, prompted with all the uh, authentication methods that are available to you. And once you've selected one, uh, this method will be actually remember. And the next time you come back, you will be presented by this method by default. And uh, if you click on, you will see that widget. Uh, there we go. So if I choose uh, get a push notification, one more click. Next time I try to authenticate, I will be uh, uh, selected with, uh, with that. Now, you can still click on verify with something else if you want to go back and select a different authenticator for whatever reason, which then will become your default authenticator. Uh, 
So this is the kind of a brief overview of the concept and uh, a few reference charts that you can uh, uh, use. And uh, we're going to now look on how it really happens live. So I'm going to go back. We're going to go back to, uh, to Brent here. All right. Thanks, Dimitri. So before we dive in uh, to the live demo, uh, just a, a quick admin uh, checklist here to, to go through as you're preparing for upgrading to OIE. Uh, the first thing is just make sure that you take advantage of all of the resources that are available uh, to learn as much as you can about the upgrade process, any of the uh, any of the uh, eligibility items that you may need to complete, the eligibility tasks you may need to complete uh, based on your um, the, what's reported to you in the self service tooling, um, uh, all sorts of, of good material. And we'll don't worry, we'll have uh, links, uh, QR codes uh, for links to all of this stuff at the end of the presentation. Also, uh, in the in the chat window for those of you that are joining us live uh, today in the Zoom chat, I've already pasted some links uh, for a lot of these resources. Uh, and for those of you who may be watching uh, after the fact on YouTube, um, we will have QR codes for all these links coming up later. But make sure you review all of the all that information uh, and take advantage of all the, the documentation that's out there. And if you still have questions, come to the community site and sign up for an office hours session uh, and talk through any questions you may have. Um, you also want to make sure that you, you have a plan, a, a test plan for uh, preparing for upgrading um, to OIE. And there is a, a good uh, sample template test plan that's available in the documentation that that's uh, referenced here as well. Um, you also also want to make sure that you always upgrade your preview org or at least some non prod tenant prior to going through with an upgrade in production. And you want to make sure that that non prod environment uh, closely mimics your actual production environment as much as possible, particularly as it relates to your policy settings, uh, you know, both around um, sign on policies, uh, MFA enrollment policies, uh, recovery policies, those types of things are the, the key things that you really want to make sure that you have uh, replicated in the non prod environment so that you can test test accurately. Um, and, you know, once you've once you've kind of gone through this process, and, and you've gone through everything in your preview environment, and you feel comfortable with what that process is going to look like, uh, take notes of that, execute a test plan and you define a process for yourself, like for your own specific cases that you can then rep re replicate for your production work. Um, a couple of common things that that we see these are these are issues or questions that come up uh, frequently among uh, customers that that I talk to on the the office hours and just things to kind of be on the lookout for. First off, uh, as far as end user experience is concerned, there are there are going to be some potential changes uh, for your end users when you when you upgrade. So the first thing is that the last MFA factor that they used that's usually remembered and it kind of defaults to the last one, that setting gets wiped clean. So they will instead be presented with all of their available enrolled authenticators on the first login. We'll see an example of that here in just a bit. Uh, there's the potential that some users may get prompted for a secondary email uh, if they don't already have a value set for one and if you're using that that field in your tenant. Uh, there's also the potential that some users may be prompted to enroll in recovery factors, depending on what your recovery policy settings are and what uh, factors that user has already enrolled in prior to upgrading. Um, also, uh, there isn't exact parity for all of the app level um, MFA increments. Um, in particular, if you're using any of the settings where on a per app level, you're setting to prompt for MFA only once ever. Uh, there's not exact parity for that particular setting. And we'll, we'll see how that manifests itself in the upgrade here in just a second in the demo. Um, in addition, uh, some other things to kind of look out for. The main things are around custom implementations, like the, the, the things that cause the most problems or, or the most common things that cause issues with upgrades usually center around some type of custom implementation that exists in the environment. This could be a custom web application that has uh, custom sign-in pages, whether that's using um, you know, SDKs or APIs to build a custom login page or an embedded widget with some customizations, native mobile applications that have their own custom login uh, flows that have been built out, uh, custom recovery 
flows that may have been built out using APIs, um, custom factor or authenticator enrollment flows. So uh, customize uh, end user management screens where, where you're building your own uh, MFA enrollment screens, that type of thing. It, uh, custom implementations with session management. So if you're making API calls to the sessions endpoint, uh, there are certain uh, of those uh, API calls that are actually deprecated for OIE. So depending on what you're doing, there may, there could be some potential issues there. Uh, if you have automation scripts uh, that are running, uh, performing various tasks, there's the potential for uh, some issues there you want to look out for. Um, CLI tools, so command, command line interface tools. Some of these that are known tools will maybe called out in your uh, OIE upgrade hub, but there could always be other tools that we're not aware of that are um, using API-based flows to authenticate that potentially could run into issues. So those are the kinds of things that you want to be on the lookout for. All right, so without further ado, let's switch gears here. I'm going to switch over to my live environment here. So let me switch my screens. Okay, so this is my uh, classic tenant. I'm logged in as an admin. Um, you can see that I've got the self-service tooling enabled for this environment. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and schedule my upgrade or take the first steps anyway to schedule my upgrade. So it's going to initially run an eligibility check. I've already kind of preemptively taken care of a couple of the configuration items that needed to be completed. Um, and I'm going to just go ahead and acknowledge the couple of uh, acknowledgement items that I have here. For the interest of time, I'm not going to go into great detail about each one of these items. There are a lot of potential uh, either configuration items or acknowledgement items that you, that you may run across. For each one, you'll notice there is a learn more link here that you can click on and get to detailed documentation about that specific item. Uh, so make sure you read through all of that uh, documentation around each item that's called out for you. Um, if you still have questions after reading that documentation, as I said, come to the community site and sign up for an office hour session and we can work through those with you. But once you've completed all of the configuration tasks and acknowledged all of the uh, acknowledgement items, you're ready to actually set a, a date. So I'm going to go ahead and schedule this for later today. Uh, you can schedule anywhere from two hours out up to 30 days in advance. I'm just going to go ahead and schedule for later this afternoon. And in just a minute, we're actually going to cheat, and I'll have one of my colleagues go ahead and, and manually upgrade this so we don't have to wait until later. But before we do that, I do want to kind of take note of some of the settings that I have here prior to the upgrade so that we can kind of see how those translate uh, once we do upgrade. So first off, uh, starting with our applications. So I've got a handful of applications here, and I've kind of... I've taken the approach of uh, sort of managing these or, or dividing these into three different categories. I've got high assurance applications, medium assurance applications, and low assurance applications. And I'm, I'm setting app level policies accordingly. So for my high assurance applications, I have sign-on policies that require MFA on every sign-on. For my medium assurance applications. I have sign-on policies that are requiring uh, MFA once per session. And then for my low assurance applications, I have a policy that is requiring uh, MFA only once. Now, this is, this is a setting that I want you to pay attention to because uh, there is not exact parity for this in OIE, so you'll we'll see what happens here uh, when we get the upgrade. Uh, I do have another uh, not quite as low assurance <laughs> application that has a slightly different increment, uh, which is requiring MFA once per week, and we'll see what happens with this one as well once we upgrade. Um, so that, that's the app level um, policies. And then as far as the global policies under my sign-on policies. I It's a pretty simple construct here. I basically have a policy for admins that requires MFA at every sign-in. And then I have a policy for everyone else that does not require MFA. So I'm, I'm 
uh, sort of deferring most of my MFA requirements to the app level with, with this policy construct. Um, also, while we're here, let's take a look at our password policy because this is going to have some impact um, on potentially what the end user experience is on their first login after, after upgrading. So in my uh, password policy here, I'm enabling recovery to be uh, initiated through SMS, voice call, or email. I am requiring a security question as part of that flow. Um, and I'm allowing for pretty much everyone to do the full range of self-service. So change, reset, and, un and unlock. Um, as far as my MFA policies, uh, you can see the factor types that I have enabled here. So Octaverify, SMS, Voice, Google, WebAuthn, and email. And in terms of the enrollment policies, uh, basically, I've got everything set to optional here for my enrollment policies. Um, lastly, let's just take a look at some of our users. So we've got a handful of users here. Uh, all but me are from the uh, the greatest college band of all time. So let's take a look at uh, some of these guys. So we look at the profile for some of these users. Um, we have a mixture. Some of our users have a secondary email set. Um, some of them, if we check their multi-factor, we can see some of them are, have multiple factors enrolled. Some of them don't. So if we look at, I think Bill Barry maybe doesn't have everything. Um, he does have a secondary email. Does he have more than one? Yeah, he, no, he has not set up any factors yet. So there we go. Now let's switch gears and let's kind of take a look at uh, what the end user experience looks like currently while we're still in, in Classic. And I'll switch over to my end user profile. And I'm going to go ahead and log in as Michael Stipe. So we can see just to get to our dashboard, uh, I'm not requiring an MFA for the global policy. If I try to go to an application like one of these, like a high assurance app, for example, I will get prompted. Now, I, it went ahead and defaulted to my biometric, the, the web auth in. Um, I do have, I can cancel this. Um, I do have another authenticator enrolled here, so I could choose another option. Um, in the interest of time, let's just do this. And you'll notice it did remember the last one that I used and defaulted to that. Um, also, if we look at my settings here, I can see that I've got um, WebAuthn set up. I've got SMS set up. Um, I have a security question set up uh, bonus points to anybody who can answer Michael Stipe's security question there. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So we can see we've got, um, we've seen what things look like for our, our end user in Classic. We've seen what things look like in the uh, admin console for Classic. Let's actually go ahead and kick off our, our upgrade now. So I'll ask, uh, my colleague, if you would go ahead and fire off that upgrade now in the background. And as that completes, just give me a shout out. And I'll refresh the screen here as we're going along. Uh, you've been upgraded, sir. All right. So we are we are now upgraded. So and we can tell if we look. Uh, actually, I guess on the end user, it doesn't really while while the session is still active, you really won't notice any difference. So you, you notice, first of all, my end user session is still alive. I can I can still see my dashboard. I can still go to my settings screen. Now, one thing you will note, um, if I go to the applications, in OIE, uh, there's a different session cookie um, that is created for the, the sort of OIE-centric session versus the classic style session. There is... Um, backwards compatibility with the old 
session. So when you have the OI or the old classic session and you present that classic session cookie to an OIE tenant, it will honor that and give you a new OIE or what's called IDX session cookie. But there is some additional context typically that would be in the IDX token that isn't there if you didn't go through the IDX login flow, which we didn't hear. We just had an existing session. So when I try to access some of these applications, some of that application level context is going to be missing. So you'll notice when I try to access my uh, high assurance app, which I already access in this, in this session. Well, actually, this is a bad example because that's going to prompt you every time. But if I go to a medium assurance app that should only... Uh, ask for MFA once per session. We'll see that I'm, oh, actually, it let me through. Uh, okay, here we go. I think I clicked on the wrong, I think I had the wrong policy set to that app. Um, so here, it is asking me to re-authenticate before I get to that app. And that's, again, because of kind of the difference in the way that uh, some of the app level policy um, constructs work in OIE versus classic. Now I'm going to switch gears and go, oh, actually, while I'm here, let's do this really quickly. Let's um, sign out. And I'm going to do a fresh sign in. This time I'm going to sign in as a different user. I'm going to sign in as Peter Buck. Now, Peter only has the one authenticator, um, so it immediately defaulted to that one. But you'll notice that he's getting prompted for some additional um, security methods here, and this has to do with the recovery policy. So even though even though our sign-on policy um, doesn't re wouldn't require anything more than the web in we have a recovery policy that allows for recovery to be initiated with um, email, SMS, vo or voice, and it also requires a, a security question. Um, in Peter's case, he does not have an email uh, enrollment. He doesn't have a, a phone enrollment. And so he doesn't have any of the authenticators that would be used to initiate that recovery process. And in OIE, um, there's no longer a distinction between authenticators for for you know sign on for authentication versus authenticators for recovery. They all get merged together under one umbrella as an authenticator, and then you can flag those as whether you want them to be allowed for recovery only or recovery and authentication in some cases. And so, as a result of that, the the policy framework actually can evaluate this now to see if you have enrollments that that would meet not just your your uh authenticator enrollment policy and your your sign-on policies but also the recovery policies as well so there's the potential that your users may see this uh setting i'm gonna i'm gonna skip this for the in the interest of time i'm gonna sign back in as michael stipe again Michael already had an SMS uh, uh, enrollment, which can be used to satisfy not only the authentication, but all, but also the recovery. Um, so he the, he did not get that prompt. Um, and so he's able to get, get right in. Um, again, if I go to my assurance app, I think I hit, there we go. I think I still have my token there. Let's go. There we go. So if I go to an app that's requiring MFA, um, you'll notice that because this is the first time Michael has actually logged in since oh, I, he had the active session, but this is the first new login since the upgrade. Instead of defaulting to the biometric, it it prompts for uh, any of the, the enrolled factors. So I can just choose and move forward. All right. So Let's switch back to our admin view. All right, so back in our admin screen, if I refresh the screen here, we're gonna see some changes in the menu options here on the left. So 
most notably under security. I'll see that I have some new menu options here. I have authenticators. We can click here and see the authenticators that got brought over. So this is all the authenticators that we had, uh, all the factors, I guess, to use the classic terminology that we had set up previously. Uh, and our password gets brought under this umbrella as an authenticator as well. Um, now, as far as enrollment, again, we only had this the one uh, multi-factor enrollment policy that has been brought over here. So we'll see that basically everything is optional with the exception of password, which is always required in classic. So uh, when this gets brought over in the migration, you'll see password set as required in the authenticator. I do have the option now, uh, now that we're in OIE to create policies where password is optional and email is required instead. Um, so you can, you do have greater flexibility with that, but as part of the migration, you're going to see it come over in the classic style where password is, is always required. And if we go back and take a look at the password authenticator, this is where our uh, password policies have migrated. So the, the password policy that we had from classic is migrated under the password authenticator in OIE. And we can see that all of those settings should migrate over one for one. Um, if we look at our uh, rule here, we'll see that we're allowing change, reset, and unlock. And we're allowing that to be initiated via either phone uh, authenticator, so SMS or voice. And you'll notice again in OIE, phone gets cons like our SMS and voice rather get consolidated into a single factor for our single authenticator for phone uh, and email, but you do also have some other options here uh, for in OIE. So you can initiate via OctaVerify or via Google Authenticator. Um, those will not be selected by default uh, when you migrate, obviously, because they were not options in Classic. So we'll see only what we had brought over and we were requiring security question here. Again, you have some greater flexibility in OIE. You can either uh, not require it, which you could also do in Classic, or you can say that any authenticator that's used for uh, authentication can also be used to verify as part of a recovery flow. Um, next, if we look at our authentication policy, so this is where our app level policies have been migrated. And you'll notice that we have this classic migrated policy, and we've got six apps assigned to it. So if we take a look we can see our, this is basically, if we look at the details of this policy, these are all the apps. If you look at this rule. These are all the apps that did not require any MFA. So you can, you can authenticate to these apps with just a password. So these all got lumped into a single policy called classic migrated and assigned there for our, um, higher access, our, um, high assurance applications, we can see there's this merged policy called uh, high assurance and high assurance bookmark. If we look at that, we see we've got the two these two applications, the high assurance app and the high assurance bookmark assigned to this. And if we look at the policy, we can see that we are requiring a password plus another factor. Uh, and we can see the options that are available here. And we're gonna require MFA anytime that the, uh, for password anyway, we're gonna require the password to be provided at any time the session does not exist. And for the other authenticator, we're gonna prompt every single time you try to access the resource. Um, if we go and take a look at some of the other policies, if we look at our medium assurance, the medium assurance was the policy that prompted, uh, I believe once per session. So if we look at that policy, we'll see, uh, um, that the password is going to be, or the authentication is going to be prompted anytime that the global session does not exist. If we look at, where are we here? Uh, oh yeah. So the other thing I want to note is that if you look at the applications that were assigned here, we also had the low assurance app, which this is the one that had our policy that was set uh, for only once ever, like, uh, there was no time frame. It was just only prompt once ever, um, that got added here to this policy. And that's because there is no, 
There is no direct equivalent to prompt only once in OIE. You can you can set a time frame like a you know a X number of days or X number of hours or or whatever, but you can't just say prompt only once. Um, so that's why this one got lumped here. If we look back at one of our other ones, so the one that was not quite as low assurance, that this one is the one that prompt that was set to prompt once a week, I believe. So if we look at the policy here, um, here this one did migrate over um, to once every seven days. So there was correlation here, um, but for the, the only once, it, it's it's not going to it's there's not direct parity for that one so that one's definitely going to change so if you're using those types of policies be aware uh, that there will be some ramifications so you'll want to make sure that you uh, test all of this out and see what what impact this is going to have on your end users in a non-prod environment before you upgrade so that you can communicate to them uh, what those changes are going to be um all right perfect so thanks brent uh, i think that was a pretty comprehensive uh, before after including the migration process um now brent's going to to be back uh, a little later to uh show you uh, the different resources that are available to you um for the, the successful uh, upgrade uh, to uh, oie uh, before we do that i want to spend a little bit of time and i'm, I'm going to be probably a, a little more brief than i had thought on the what what we're actually unleashing once you've done the upgrade from a classic to oie so on this slide you you actually have the the catalog of uh, new features if you want that are available with oie so we covered some of them uh, things like authenticator factor types and assurance level, which are, I would say, more uh, new concept that features, but phishing resistance, we'll chat about that a little bit, um, uh, authentication policy at the application level, uh, device context, where I'm going to spend a little bit of time, uh, passwordless experience. Um, I'm not going to cover passwordless experience and fast pass into details, but uh, you will see in the resources that we run the whole webinar on that. Uh, last year and it's uh, it's uh, still very valid in terms of information so you can deep dive into how to implement passwordless experiences by uh, by looking at this uh, webinar flexible recount recovery uh, we will touch on that a little bit uh, brands show you some example but i want to give you a, a few reference slides for that um to capture new deployment models which are more on the on the customer uh, type of apps uh together with the sdk and uh, there's a number of other features email magic link as well is one uh, that we have covered in the uh, passwordless webinar which could be interesting for some use cases uh, as well and uh, on the administration side the the management sdk and the terraform also uh, support has uh, some uh, some significant enhancements so that's pretty much the catalog of what you could look out uh, in the documentation how to leverage uh, best uh, best uh, oie so i want to touch on those four features i'm going to go fast on some of them uh, because we we are approaching the end and again i want to leave time to to walk through the different resources so uh phishing resistance with fast pass device context uh, flexible account recovery and octa device access which is a, a fairly new uh, feature uh, phishing resistance with a uh, with um, a fast pass Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on that for the reason I explained. There's a whole webinar on it. So obviously, the objective is to eliminate password. But if you eliminate password, you actually remove a factor type, which is knowledge. So how do you compensate in the multi-factor world is the challenge here. What I would like to highlight uh, aside the benefits of FastPass, which is uh, first we actually follow the NIST recommendation for, for a very strong phishing resistant integrator, uh, authenticator. Um, it is uh, integrated with the device management tools as well, so you can leverage device context. And um, it is uh, uh, also available on, the, on major devices, so on Mac, Windows, uh, iOS, uh, iPhone, and uh, Android devices. What is really uh, what I want to kind of zooming a little bit here is uh, is some of the the internals of the mechanics on why uh, it is uh, it is phishing resistant. So uh, when you first uh, there's obviously the enrollment process on FastPass. So uh, when you initiate the enrollment process, you'll be asked to authenticate with another factor. And what is uh, important to understand is that at the moment of your authenticated and you're enrolling into FastPass, what's happening is that FastPass is going to generate a key pair with a private key and a public key. The private key is going to be stored on the device in the security module if there's one available, and the public key will be sent to the backend. And uh, the Octa backend will create a binding between this public key and the device. So 
What is important here is that this cryptographic uh, mechanism that exists between the device and the backend is first secure because it's based on private key, public key, but also the private key never leaves the device. So this is what you know, significantly uh, uh, helps and, uh, and provide uh, the, the, the phishing resistance because the secret is never exchanged, the secret never leaves the device. So, and then once the hormone is successful, you can use this as an authentication method. So, again, there's more detail on FastPass and how to implement it uh, in the hub and in the form of a webinar. But I at least wanted to highlight uh, the availability of this feature because this is one of the most popular features in, uh, in OIE. The second uh, aspect is a device context. So we also have a webinar on device context, but it is really a, a significant announcement in OIE. So I want to touch on that uh, rapidly here. So if you want to understand devices in, uh, in, in, in the OIE, is that uh, you can create a context context aware authentication policy. So what does that mean is that, first of all, there is a concept of a registration of, uh, of the device. So when you uh, install and enroll Octavary 5, there is a registration mechanism, an enrollment mechanism, but that also allows us to get some information about the device. And it also allows us to track the device in the universal directory. So in universal directory for each user, you will see the devices on which the end user is enrolled with Octavary 5. And this gives us a first level of device insurance, assurance because we can capture some signal just from Octa Verify. Now, this is dependent on the OS, uh, whether it is Windows, Mac OS, or iOS, so you will have to look at the, at the specifics. But usually, you can know the, 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 the level of the OS, uh, if there is a biometric presence, so a number of information, for which you actually do not need any MDM solution. So, just by registering the device and enrolling your Verify, you get a certain level of context already that you can enforce. Now, if you want to go one step further, you can leverage third-party tools. So, you can leverage MDM tools, like you were doing before in, um, in, uh, in Classic, but you can also now uh, leverage signals from uh, endpoint security tools, uh, such as uh, Windows Security Center or CrowdStrike. And we see a, a very brief example of that. So that's really the, 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 all the different information you can get the device and integrity to your policies. Now, how do you integrate this into your policy? So you can add device assurance policies that you attach. Then you can use MDM integration, and we will see how we uh, get uh, some of the, the signals there. And finally, when you are in the, the, the creation of an authentication policy, you can now say, well, depending on the state of the device, if it's any state, or if it's registered, if it's managed or not managed, you can actually craft policies by adding more and more signals and make your policy more and more uh, device context aware. So that's a, a significant uh, uh, improvement in richness on what you can know and do based on the state of the device. Uh, this is just a very simple example of a, a registered device in OIE. So you can see in Universal Directory the different uh, devices that have been registered for those different users here. And the uh, Octa Verify again available on those four different, uh, different platforms here. So finally, uh, how do you integrate those signals from uh, third party tools? You will create custom expression. And uh, in this slide, you have an example of uh, leveraging uh, in Windows Security Center, uh, the fact that there is an antivirus uh, uh, available on the device and that the firewall is on. So you can use custom expression to uh, uh, leverage those signals, which are obviously dependent on the third party tool you are using. So here is an example of, um, of a Windows Security Center. So this is briefly what I wanted to cover on uh, on, uh, on devices. Uh, flexible account recovery, uh, uh, which is a new feature in OIE and that Brent show you in action. Uh, I'm just going to browse through here so you have the different uh, the different uh, I said reference slides here. So what it is, it is a new uh, mechanism to have a, a more flexible way to uh, to recover, and it uh, it leverages uh, more 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 factors and also leverages a a two-step approach. So this two-step approach, so you create that by going into a security authenticator passwords and you can create rules. So Brent showed you that rule here. So you will specify the recovery authenticator here. And in this case, we start with email and then we ask any other uh, authenticator that is used for MFA SSO. So you can create much more sophisticated rules for account recovery. And uh, the logic, if you want, is the following. So you can have actually a two-step process 
uh, if you configure it as such. So it could be one or two steps. Uh, you create your policy, uh, your rule, policy rule, as we saw in the previous slide on the left. And then when the users come in, he will be prompted with the, the UI and the ability to select one factor. And if there's a second factor, he will be prompted for a second um, uh, authentication method. So kind of a, uh, I would say, a map on how uh, flexible account recovery works to uh, align with what uh, you've seen uh, during the, the demonstration. Finally, and I'm, and I'm only going to touch on the concept here, but uh, one of the benefits of the benefit of OIE is now uh, we have a, a release at the end of last year, Okta Device Access, so which is the ability to use a desktop MFA for Mac and Windows. So we have done, obviously, the, the, the value of that is that uh, MFA is becoming more and more necessary at all levels. So being able to integrate uh, the sign-on together with the MFA of your uh, desktop is obviously uh, something that will significantly improve the end user experience. And uh, we've delivered this capability uh, both for uh, Mac OS and for Windows. So the ability to enforce MFA on top of passwords to log in uh, to your managed desktop of your virtual machine. And uh, for uh, Mac OS, the ability to synchronize the different passwords. Uh, so there's a plenty of documentation available on our website. You have the link here, so you will have a look at that. But I wanted to make sure I mentioned uh, that uh, capability uh, because it's, uh, it's a great new feature and the benefit of OI. So that was kind of an overview of some of the features. There's obviously uh, much more time you can spend on that. And uh, I'm going to go back to uh, Brent to show you a walkthrough of the different uh, resources that are available for you to successfully upgrade to uh, uh, OI. All right. Thanks, Dimitri. If we go ahead and move to the next slide. Perfect. Uh, so, yeah. So, as I noted earlier, there are a number of resources that are available out there. I have posted, for those of you who are on the live session with us, in the Zoom chat window, uh, there are links to a number of resources, including this one. Um, uh, so, this first one is the uh, OIE Resources Hub. Um, this is a great starting point. Uh, it has a great overview of OIE in general, links to knowledge base resources, uh, link to the OIE community site, as well as link to the YouTube playlist where we have a, a lot these webinar recordings, as well as other uh, OIE related content. So this is a, a great place to start. Uh, if you're joining us on the recording, you can scan the QR code uh, in the top left of your slide here. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. And the, the next resource I want to call out is the knowledge base, the OIE upgrade knowledge base hub. So here you'll find uh, knowledge base articles around all sorts of OIE related topics, eligibility tasks, uh, feature changes in OIE. This is where you'll also find that uh, template for an upgrade test plan. Uh, so lots of good resources here. Uh, and again, uh, for those of you who are joining us on the recording, you can re reach this link by scanning the QR code in your top left. All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, next thing I want to call out is more uh, for the developers. So if you have a lot of custom uh, implementation, a custom uh, you know uh, uh, like sign-in page implementations or, or custom development work in your tenant, uh, your developers uh, definitely want to check out the upgrade hub on developer.octa.com. Uh, you'll get information on changes with the API, the new OIE SDKs. Uh, sign-in widget info, additional developer resources, as well as uh, tips and strategies for developer-centric testing of, of your custom applications. Again, uh, developers scan the QR code in the top left to get to that link. And next slide. Uh, ah, this is the community slide I've been referencing. So this is where you can go to sign up for office hours. So if after looking at documentation, you still have some questions, come here to the community site, feel free to register for office hour session. We have uh, 30 minute one-on-one -on -one blocks available. Uh, we also have a weekly group session every Wednesday at noon Eastern, nine Pacific uh, that you can join. Uh, we have space for up to 10 customers each week uh, in that uh, group session. You can also post questions directly here in the forum and you can come here to get updates on uh, ex upcoming events like these webinars, uh, when the webinar recordings are available, we'll post updates here uh, as we have new uh, content that's that's available, maybe on the YouTube channel, et cetera. We usually post updates here as well. So this is a great site to check out. And then finally, oh, sorry, what, yeah, here we go. Uh, just kind of a, a 
uh, I guess, a coming attraction. Um, we do have a new uh, video, and this is kind of um, geared towards admins to help you identify whether or not you may have some custom uh, development work in <laughs> that exists in your Okta environment. Uh, so we've got a new video that's going to be going live uh, tomorrow on the uh, OIE playlist on the Okta YouTube channel to kind of help uh, give you some tips on how to identify different types of custom authentication deployment models, uh, and then uh, direct you on where to go for more detailed help if you discover that you do have uh, some custom um, implementations in your environment. All right, next slide. And finally, uh, be on the lookout for the next webinar in this series. We don't have a definite date yet, uh, but we we will be returning sometime in March. Um, uh, it will post uh, the specific dates uh, in an update on the community site. So feel free to check that out. Um, and yeah, make sure make sure to join if you're able. Um, with that, I think we're right at about time. Do we have any? Uh, I see we have one open question that Dan is furiously typing an answer for. Um, so I think we have we... people with their hands raised. I'm not sure if we have time to maybe let them ask their question. Yeah, uh, let's see. We have Ram, Ram, and Ram, and, and Mike have their hands raised. All right, Ron, did you have a question? I think you should be able to. Yeah, you're muted, Ron, if you're talking. Yep. You should be able to unmute now if you. If you're still there. Are you with us, Ron? All right, let's move to maybe Mike. Let's try uh, Mike. Are you able to? Are you able to unmute? Yep, I really? think so. Can you hear me? Yes, we yep. can. Hear you. Awesome. Um, I actually have my hand up by mistake, but I do have a question now that you put me on the spot. Um, so I had this curiosity. You said you had the ability to enforce MFA once per week, right? Um, but my question is, what if within that week they log on from a different device? Would that trigger? So, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say. So the that those settings are some of that's going to depend on um, like what you set for your or, or how you set your session cookies in the uh, global session policy. So there's an option now to enable persistent cookies or not. It's it's disabled by default, and that's generally the recommendation. But those those settings, even the ones that are, uh, you know, prompts, you know, for authenticator, like every seven days or what, you know, whatever the case may be, those are still dependent on the, the session being there. So um, like if you're, if, if they're logging in from a different device or if they're, you know, if they kill their session and then come back in, they're they're still going to get that that prompt. So it's it behaves a little differently in OIE than it than it did in classic in that sense. So so basically they would get prompted again by yeah. default. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thanks everyone once again for joining. Uh, we're a couple minutes over. I appreciate everyone's attendance. And uh, like I said, be on the lookout for upcoming events. And uh, if you want to review uh, this session that will be posted on the YouTube channel, hopefully within a couple of weeks. Uh, but thanks again. Thanks to Dimitri, uh, Dan, Rashir. Uh, as always, you guys did a great job. Uh, appreciate it. And we will see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.